My first guest is one half of the great pop soul duo Hall & Oates. He's also the author of a new memoir called Change of Seasons. Here is John Oates. As I was preparing for this interview, I was listening to your music, mm -hmm. thinking about it a lot, mm -hmm. and I was getting my car fixed. Right. And I'm in the waiting room. I wasn't getting my car fixed. I was getting a new key, which costs $300 and takes an hour to do. <laughs> but one of your songs comes on, Maneater comes on. Okay. Do you remember when that started happening, when you were in the grocery store and your music is playing, and no longer is it just I hear myself on the radio, but we're part of the, the culture at large. Well, you know, it started happening, uh, it started happening in the 70s. You know, we had a hit with Rich Girl, we had a hit with Sarah Smile, and we had She's Gone, back to back. So we had three, uh, three top five records in a row, and uh, so it was happening then. Then we had a little bit of a lull in the late 70s, but then of course the 80s, you know, it went nuts, it exploded. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been hearing records in the supermarket for a while now. What do you do? Like you're buying beans. I usually, I usually make a joke, another three cents, you know, or uh, I'll say, yeah, hey, my, my kid goes to an expensive college. Somebody's got to pay for it. <laughs> Can we talk about Philadelphia sure. a little bit? Um, were you just there on book tour? Um, how about uh, about eight hours ago? There we go, eight yeah. hours ago. Um, one thing you say in the book which amazes me, which also seems totally true to what the cliche or the maybe the real thing about Philadelphia, a town that booed Santa Claus once, if I remember, <laughs> uh, is that you guys had no place for the British invasion. No. That's amazing. Like, you had your own stuff. Philadelphia totally rejected the earliest days of the British invasion, and, and in particular, the Beatles, because Philadelphia had this, this tradition of teenage dancing. Bandstand started in Philadelphia. And I mean, if you think about Bandstand, you know, a lot of people write off Bandstand as just this little Dick Clark teenage dance show, which, you know, was on TV for 30 years, but whatever. But the, you have to remember, before Bandstand, music, rock music was regional, regionally uh, associated in America. You had music, the music, if you went to Memphis, the, the radio stations you heard there were playing different music than the ones in Chicago or in Nashville or in New York, or in Philadelphia, or in Chicago. With small labels. Small labels, regionally oriented stuff. And that's where the regional music in America comes from. The Chicago blues, Motown, you know, Philly R, the Philly R&B thing, the Gamble and Huff thing. But Bandstand kind of basically united the, the teenage culture of the country. Yeah. Because for the first time, kids who were watching TV anywhere in America could see a group of kids they could see what they were wearing, and you know how teenagers like to dress alike. They could see the type of dances they were doing, how they were acting, and it actually galvanized and pulled together a teenage culture um, for the first time. So what def what's your definition of Philly soul? Well, you know, first of all, I, I have to say that I don't have any definition of soul because to me, soul cannot be defined. It's soul is an emotional connection to something. I, I, I see, I hear soul music all over the place. I hear it in, Celtic Irish music has a lot of soul. Um, you know, it's soul music is music that touches you and resonates with you. It's not the domain of a, a race or a group of people. So that being said, Philadelphia R&B is a di very distinct thing, um, and that's that's really that's that's owned by Gamble and Huff. Um, they developed it. We started out with Gamble and Huff. Yeah, right. Daryl and I made our first. Daryl made his first record with Kenny Gamble and, and and Leon Huff. I made my first record with Bobby Martin, who went on to become uh, their top arranger. He arranged all the back backstabbers and for the love of money by the OJ's. Um, so we actually started at the same time, and of course Gamble and Huff went on on their way. And we we actually had a decision to make in 1972. Were, were we going to go with Gamble and Huff and actually become staff writers and perhaps producers and be part of their team, which would have been pretty amazing because I'm sure we would have done something really cool and interesting with them. Uh, but no, we, we had a different different dream and we, we, we felt like we needed to go to New York, we needed to break out of Philadelphia and we needed to, we wanted to be, have a more of a world view. There's a great moment though, I think it comes up a couple times in the book, where you talk about how Early on in your friendship with, with Daryl and your musical relationship, you would sit on the stoop mm -hmm. and you would just, just play. Oh, yeah. And there's a sense in the book, and part of the, the book is very immediate, and I think part of that is due to the fact that you kept a journal yeah. throughout it all. Yeah. But there's also this sense that I kind of I miss being there. Yeah, I kind of miss that. You know what? So do I. 
No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being you there. Oh. Because I never sat on yes. the stoop in Philadelphia and played any kind of good music. <laughs> well, you would have enjoyed it. no talent. You would have enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that you sense that I miss being you there. You definitely seem to oh, miss it. Oh, I absolutely. Well, then, then, if, then if that... If that got over to you, if that got to you, you're 100% right, because I do. To me, the, 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 the process of becoming is way more interesting than the victory lap of the 80s. You know, everybody knows that, the hits, the MTV videos. We were so... What hits? What hits? Yeah, those, just a few. Um, but the 70s were exciting. Anything you're doing for the first time is always exciting. You, That's the craziest thing about you guys, and I won't say Hall and Oates because you don't like to be referred to as it's Daryl Hall and John Oates. It, 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 but I can't help it. I can't that's help right, it. Sorry. But I'm a kid of the 80s. Mm -hmm. I started listening to the hits. Right. Eventually I went back. Sure. But you had a whole, what, a band like Jeanette is 73, right? That's right. You had a whole life before that. That's right. We were traveling the country for the first time. We were going to ta cities and towns for the first time, meeting new people who would come out of the woodwork and go, Man, we heard your record on the radio. We love. We're like, well, really? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And then we'd sleep on their floor and hang out at their house. And there were girls and fun. And 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 then another set, another town. And it was like being a, it was like being an apparition who would just appear and party and then play and leave. It was amazing. And I would go back there in a second. So let let's talk a little bit though about the the biggest years. Sure. You don't spend a ton of time in the book on them, though. You do spend on purpose. some. On purpose. Okay, so why? Really what ended up happening, and this is maybe perhaps something that people don't real, realize about success, is that the biggest issue and the, the problem and downfall of being su super successful, especially when it comes to popularity, success, success of popularity, is that you lose time. You have no time for anything. Yeah. Because the demands ratchet up um, for everything. Uh, you're, you know, whether it's the creative demands, the business demands, you know, you, you just lose track of time. And the 80s were, were like on hyperdrive for us. I mean, I literally would write some songs, we'd go in the studio, we'd record them, we'd make a video, we'd get on a bus or a plane, and we'd take off and go on tour. We'd come back and do it again. And that happened, that started, it really, well, it started in 72, but honestly, but, but once in 1980, for, the, for that next six years, yeah. it never, ever stopped. So here's Not my big question. Second. I get all that. So how, if life is going by at a just insane pace, how do you at that same moment, both of you guys, write the biggest hits of your lives? You would think that it would be the opposite. You would think that that would be a time when you didn't have even a second to sit down and compose something great. It's because when we started producing ourselves in 1980 with the Voices album, Everything that we had always wanted to do in that preceding 10 years came together. It was the culmination of the experiences and the recording experiences, the touring experiences, and the writing and creating ex creative experiences that all came together with this amazing band that we had developed and the fact that we were producing ourselves, making the exact records that we wanted to make. That's why it was successful. Don't get pissed at me for asking this. You wrote or con were the first person to conceive of songs like Man Eater, Out of Touch, your voice is incredible. Why aren't you the lead on some of these later songs? Well, what happened was in the early, in the 70s actually it happened, yeah. it started. There was a little more, ec 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 it was a little more equal in the early 70s in terms of vocal. It absolutely was. What happened was radio gravitated toward Daryl's voice and Daryl's voice became the signature sound of the band because the songs, and I had released a number of singles with me singing, and they, they did pretty well, top 20, top 30, but they never became the big hits. As soon as Daryl started singing and it locked in, it became, it became a signature thing. And as soon as that happened, that was a fake to complete, it was, it was what it was. So what was my choice? I write a song like Man Eater or Out of Touch with the, pretty much the knowledge that if I sing it, it's probably gonna be good, but if Daryl sings it, there's a really good chance it's going to be huge. Now, I'm a pretty smart guy. <laughs> you made the right choice. Uh, and I'm a team player. And I'm, par I'm, and I'm part of a partnership. Well, if you, are that, if you are in a partnership and you want that partnership to be successful, you have to make certain decisions. And so I made those decisions. So you come Simple. up. Yeah, that makes... It sounds like you made the That's the kind of person right, I am. I made the right decisions. Of course yeah. I made the right decision. Well, I'm sure you've made wrong decisions. Yeah, plenty. 
let's talk about those. Sure. What? Oh, I know where you're going. You're good. You're no, good. I am not going Mark, anywhere. Mark, you're good. I'm not going anywhere. I love. Well, I, know, I love where you're going. I don't want to get behind the music on you. But you, you can go anywhere you want. When you come I'm, out of the '80s, I'm an open book. You Mark, to, you totally. <laughs> <laughs> how you come out of the '80s? Here's a here's a question that I want to know. Yeah. How much of coming out of the '80s and feeling a little lost, feeling like I don't I don't know who I am quite anymore? How much of that is all the success that you've had, and now what do I do? Or it's been so fast. And how much of it was you reach? I'm 43. I don't know where I'm going. Like, there's a certain time when it's midlife crisis time, mm -hmm. and you're past it now. I'm I'm going into it. Yeah. So help me out. I will help you yeah, out. Yeah, help me. Buy yourself a red sports car. That's, <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> but then you had to sell them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. At least I had it to sell, though. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> no, you know what it was, man. I um, I rebooted my life basically. I rode my bike for two years. I didn't have a car. I skied. I hiked. Met this amazing girl. We bought some property eventually. Built a house. Had a kid. And I lived a real life from 1989 till 1996. And you shaved your mustache, I shaved my which foot. was a symbolic. It's Yes, it was a ritual shedding of the <laughs> facial hair. Absolutely. <laughs> but and now you got facial and hair. That back. Seems, it, seems, it seems stupid, right? It, no, it, it doesn't. seems insignificant. I get it. it was extremely significant because I was associated with this giant Absolutely. mustache. Absolutely. Well, I wasn't that guy anymore, and yeah. I wasn't going to be that guy, so. How much do you and Daryl have to discuss things, or is it still like 85? We don't talk about anything. Nothing. Really? I, I don't, I can go, I can go, I could go a whole year without talking to him. Huh. But the moment we get on stage or arrive in the dressing room or whatever, it's as if time stopped. It's as if nothing has changed. Yeah. It's exactly like having a brother. That's, you know, you know how it is with family. Yeah. You, you, family can move different parts of the country or whatever. You come back home for the holidays or whatever, and you pick up on those conversations and the old anecdotes and the old thing. And it's really exactly like that. Well, thanks for coming on the interview. Well, this is show. a good interview, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're this awesome, was great. man. Right. All right. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Thank you. All right. Funding for the interview show is provided by Lagunitas. Beer speaks, people mumble, except on the interview show. The Lagunitas Tap Room in Chicago is at 2607 West 17th Street.